So, let's dive into the nail-biting final episode of The Fall of the House of Usher. It's like an hour of TV that's jam-packed with revelations. We finally get the lowdown on the dark secrets Roderick and Madeline have been hiding from their youth. Spill the beans on their shady deal with Verna, uncover the chilling truth behind the Usher children's demise, and even get a glimpse into what happened with Auguste Dupin's investigation into Fortunato's role in the opioid epidemic. But here's the kicker. For all the plot fireworks, there's a bunch of enigmas that keep you scratching your head after your first watch. Like, how the heck does this whole agreement with Verna work? And what's the deal with her visit to the Usher's final resting place? Why in the world does she leave them those mysterious gifts? And hang on a second, who even is this Verna character? Don't fret if you're left pondering these mysteries after watching The Raven. We've got your back with a breakdown of the key happenings in Mike Flanagan's spine-tingling, Poe-inspired horror series. So grab your popcorn and let's unravel the secrets of the House of Usher together. The fall of the House of Usher leans into its horror roots. Let's chat about Mike Flanagan's horror journey in The Fall of the House of Usher. You see, Flanagan's previous TV projects often delve deep into emotions like The Haunting of Bly Manor. But in Usher, he goes all in on the horror vibes. Jump scares? You bet. Flanagan isn't typically a fan, but here they pop up in almost every episode. It's a bit different from his usual slow burn, dread-filled style, and it's intentional. These sudden scares add a layer of vulnerability to Roderick's character and pay homage to various horror subgenres, from gore to psychological and even body horror. It's Poe's world, after all. Now, where Usher fumbles a bit is when it tries to juggle too many narrative balls. It's a murder mystery, but there's also a pharmaceutical angle, legal stuff, and supernatural elements, not to mention all those flashbacks and time jumps. It's like Flanagan is spinning plates and trying to keep them all in the air at once. Whether he pulls it off is up for debate. The show also wants to comment on the opioid crisis and the complexities of women in business, but it feels like these themes are more decoration than a deep dive. Characters have their own baggage infidelity, family struggles, unequal marriages, but there's just not enough time to do justice to these issues. Each character could practically have their own series. Despite the occasional narrative overload, The Fall of the House of Usher is undoubtedly spine-tingling, showing Flanagan's horror skills once again. It's not just about pounding hearts, it's about the complex emotions that keep you hooked. Who is Verna? Let's talk about Verna in the final episode of The Fall of the House of Usher. I mean, seriously, is she even human? The evidence suggesting she's more supernatural than your average Joe has been stacking up like a house of cards throughout the series. First off, she's got these mind-bending powers of persuasion. Like that time she effortlessly cleared out the staff at Prospero's party or tricked poor Frederick into spiking his coke with Nightshade Paralyzer. Not to mention her reality-warping skills, like swapping places with crazed chimps or turning ugly rats into cute kittens. That's not your typical party trick, right? Then there's the photographic evidence, with Verna popping up in snapshots of influential folks dating way back to the early 1900s. Oh, and remember that scene where Madeline tries to off her, but Verna casually reappears in another part of the room? And let's not forget about that mysterious bar that's more elusive than a unicorn, but in The Raven, we get even more hints that Verna's otherworldly. She brings Roderick back from the brink of a ligadone overdose for crying out loud. And when we dive into the 1970s, we learn that the pact she struck with Madeline and Roderick exists outside space and time. Her bar vanishes into thin air the moment the Usher twins step out the door. Intriguingly, she dodges Arthur Pym's deadly injection like it's no big deal, follows up with a chat about human cruelty and pact-making, and then casually transforms into a raven after leaving her cryptic gifts on the Usher family graves. But the fall of the House of Usher leaves us hanging when it comes to defining exactly what Verna is. Is she the devil, as those pacts might suggest? Well, not so fast. This series doesn't commit to any heavy-handed religious themes like some other Mike Flanagan works do. The closest thing we get to an answer is from Madeline, who dubs Verna Death herself in their final chat. But even that's an assumption, so let's keep a pinch of skepticism on hand. What's Verna's deal with Roderick and Madeline? All right, buckle up. Because in the grand finale of The Fall of the House of Usher, we finally get the lowdown on how Madeline and Roderick first crossed paths with the enigmatic Verna. It's one of those aha moments we've been waiting for. So picture this. It's the swinging 1970s, and Madeline and Roderick stroll into Verna's bar with a diabolical plan in mind. 
They've just walled up poor Rufus Griswold in Fortunato's basement, and they need an airtight alibi. As they chat with Verna, she gets curious about their insatiable hunger for wealth and power. When the bar empties out, she lays it all on the line. She's ready to grant them their wildest dreams, but in return, she wants their heirs' lives. Talk about a Faustian bargain. Specifically, she's gunning for their bloodline to end, hence why Roderick's kids start dropping like flies once he's diagnosed with vascular dementia. If he's not got much time left, neither do his offspring. Charming, right? Verna throws them a curveball. She gives them a choice, a chance to say no, and let their kids have longer though tougher lives. Roderick, though, doesn't even pause to ponder the offer. He's all about the money. Money makes life easier, sure, but it also gives him the power to pull strings and control those around him. He's been throwing his fortune around like confetti, even buying governments, companies, and, yep, the affection of his own children. This pact with Verna isn't just a window into Roderick's true colors. It's also the show's way of wagging a finger at billionaires worldwide. The Usher duo raked in their riches on the backs of the less fortunate and the future generations. Their so-called pain-erasing drug caused suffering and addiction. Now, it's the young guns left to clean up the mess. Whether they're trying to salvage the Usher name or picking up the pieces of their families shattered by addiction and overdose. Or, as fate would have it, striking their own eerie deals with an otherworldly entity. Let the next generation deal with the fallout, Verna tells them. And that's precisely what they're left to do, Usher name or not. Why do Roderick and Madeline kill each other? All right, let's talk about Madeline and her unique way of dodging her pact with Verna. While Roderick went for the have a boatload of kids route, Madeline took a different approach. She got herself an IUD post-bar visit, ensuring she'd never have any heirs to cough up for her crimes. But here's the kicker, that IUD wasn't a get-out-of-jail-free card with Verna. When she came to collect her end of the deal, Madeline found out the hard way that having no kids didn't mean she could avoid paying the piper. And even her attempts to bump off her brother, thinking that would settle the score, were no dice. Verna made it clear that they'd have to kick the bucket side by side. You came into this world together, and you go out of it together. Now, let's rewind to the part where Roderick pulls this bizarre move, mummifying Madeline and plunking in her eye sockets some sapphires he scored as a birthday present, swiped from an ancient Egyptian empress. Strange, right? But here's the twist. Madeline wasn't planning to stay six feet under. If you remember Eliza's story from episode one, it was already a clue that usher women have a knack for clawing their way back from the grave to settle scores with the men who wronged them. So, while Roderick's busy chatting with Dupin, guess what? Madeline's alive and kicking, making a ruckus in the basement, fighting her way out. When she finally escapes, she dishes out some good old-fashioned vengeance, offing her brother with her own two hands. It's a real like-mother-like-daughter moment, echoing her mother's slaying of Mr. Longfellow and sealing the deal on Verna's prophecy. What is the meaning of Verna's final visit to the Usher's graves? Now that Madeline and Roderick Usher are pushing up daisies and their heirs are toast, Dupin's case against the Usher clan goes down the drain. Juno inherits the family biz but decides to pull the plug, leaving nothing to prosecute. The only one who ends up facing the music is Arthur Pym, who couldn't strike a deal with Verna because he's got no collateral, no heirs or loved ones to bargain with. So, Roderick's statement to Dupin, recorded in that trusty old tape recorder, remains intact by his graveside. But Dupin's not the only one paying a visit to the Usher family's final resting place. Verna swings by too, and while we hear her voice reciting some Edgar Allan Poe, she leaves behind tokens she snagged from the Ushers. Poe, of course, is the grand inspiration behind this whole House of Usher deal. Now those tokens aren't just any trinkets. They shimmer and shine because they meant the world to their owners. It's what they clung to as their lives crumbled around them. Take Prospero's mask, for example. It's a nod to his obsession with pleasure. Camille's phone, on the other hand, symbolizes her nosy tendencies. Leo's collar is all about his fixation on his boyfriend's cat. Victorine's heart mesh? That's tied to her thirst for power. Tamerlane's golden bug? It's a nod to her wellness empire dreams. And Frederick's coke bag laced with a nightshade paralyzer is a dark reminder of addiction and torment. Madeline, well, she gets those sapphires Roderick scored, symbols of the eternal life she longed for. Ancient Egypt vibes, where these jewels were part of the afterlife kit for pharaohs, meant to serve as eyes in the afterworld. And Roderick? He gets that glass, a reminder of the cognac he sipped with Verna, sealing the deadly deal that cost his kids. 
But there's one Usher family member who didn't care much for material stuff, and that's Lenore. So she's the only one not leaving behind a shiny token. Instead, Verna gives her something special, a black feather tied to a white rose. They're fleeting, just like life, but they're beautiful, and they'll pass peacefully, much like Lenore did. That's all for today's video. What did you think about this show? Let us know in the comments below. And if you haven't already, then please like and subscribe. We'll see you in the next one.